Hello everyone and welcome to the D edition of the Honorable Mentions. We have a real mixture of everything today. You won't believe some of these things are actually real, but let's just jump right in. First off, the Dalmatian language, also known as Langa Dalmata. It's native to the Dalmatian region of modern-day southern Croatia, it's part of the Romance branch of the Indo-European language family, it's written using the Latin script, and it has been officially extinct since the year 1898. Dalmatian used to be spoken all along the eastern coast of the Adriatic Sea, as far south as Montenegro. A Romance language related to Italian, Dalmatian evolved from Vulgar Latin, spoken by the Illyro Romans in the area like 2000 years ago. It was a prominent language spoken in the Republic of Ragusa, modern-day Dubrovnik, Croatia. The official language of Ragusa was Latin until the late 15th century, when the Senate decided to make it Dalmatian for a little bit instead. But that apparently didn't last very long, as by the end of the 15th century, most people in the Republic were native speakers of Croatian. The Dalmatian language continued its decline over the centuries, as the people were gradually assimilated into one of the surrounding peoples, like Croatians or Italians. And finally, the last person to have any knowledge of the Dalmatian language passed away on June 10th, 1898. His name was Tuane Udaina, and he learned it from listening to his parents' conversations in their dialect, that of the island of Velia, modern-day island of Krk in Croatia. Mr. Udaina was not a native speaker of Dalmatian, and by the time linguist Matteo Bartoli approached him to record him, Tuane Udaina hadn't spoken Dalmatian in nearly 20 years at that point. Of course, this data was far from perfect, but they managed to record approximately 2,800 words and various stories and accounts of Tuane Udaina's life in Dalmatian. Dalmatian was quite a conservative language in the Romance group, as some of its features are quite archaic. Additionally, it's sometimes considered to be the bridge language between Italian and Romanian. Now, when it comes to Romance languages, out of the five big ones, Spanish, French, Portuguese, and Italian are really closely related to each other in both vocabulary and grammar, while Romanian was always the odd one out, not being connected to the others geographically and being more influenced by the surrounding Slavic languages and those linguistic weirdos in Hungary than the rest of its Romance cousins. And so Dalmatian being the missing link between Italian and Romanian as a gateway to the rest of the Romance language group is a pretty cool thing to think about. One of the pieces of evidence for this is that there were these sound shifts that happened when the Romance languages were evolving from Latin that only occurred in Romanian and Dalmatian. But yeah, Dalmatian was never really documented well beyond that and remains a really curious case and a bit of a mystery to this day. Next up, the Gerbal language. It's native to an area in northeast Queensland, Australia. The latest estimate I found says that there are only about eight speakers left. It's part of the Gerbalic branch of the Pamunungan language family and is written using the Latin script. Now, Gerbal is an Australian Aboriginal language, and we really don't hear anything about these, like, ever. You can argue that no continent has been hit harder in terms of destruction of linguistic diversity than Australia, which is why the vast majority of Australian Aboriginal languages are on the verge of dying. Now, Gerbal is pretty well known in the linguistics world thanks to a few very interesting features that it has. One of those features is their unusual gender noun class system. We've talked about noun class a few times before in this channel, I give a much more detailed explanation in the B edition of the Honorable Mentions video about the Buduk language, for example. But basically, Gerbal categorizes its nouns into four classes, and depending on which noun class the noun belongs to, it's probably gonna have different word endings and conjugations, and verbs might act differently around them, etc. The four noun classes of Gerbal are 1. Most animate objects and men 2. Woman, water, fire, violence, and exceptional animals 3. Edible fruit and vegetables, and 4. Miscellaneous, includes things not classifiable in the first three. How... how does this develop? Like, linguist and author George Lakoff even based the title of his book on the second noun class of Gerbal, Woman, Fire, and Dangerous Things. On top of that, Gerbal has a very interesting and complex taboo system. Basically, depending on who a Gerbal person is speaking to, they will use a different, specialized, complex form of the language known as Dyangui, and is used in the presence of the taboo relatives. It has the same grammar, but with a completely different lexicon than the non-taboo language. I won't really go into it beyond this, but just to give you a taste, some of the rules include... A speaker is completely forbidden from speaking with his, her, mother-in-law, child-in-law, father's sister's child, or mother's brother's child, and from approaching or looking directly at these people. A person is forbidden from speaking with their cross-cousin. Avoidance might be present on the grounds of indicating who is sexually unavailable. Members of the same sex such that a male individual should use the respectful style of speech in the presence of his father-in-law, but the father-in-law can decide whether or not to use the everyday style of speech or the respectful style in the presence of his son-in-law. This phenomenon is called mother-in-law languages and was quite common among Australian Aboriginal languages before the arrival of the Europeans and eventually the practice stopped around the 1930s or so. But still blows my mind, like, somebody used, used to speak like this, you know? Next up, the Dogri language. It's spoken mainly in the Jammu region of India by about 2.6 million people and it's part of the northwestern Indo-Aryan branch of the Indo-European language family. 
Dogri is an ancient language spoken in the area of modern-day India and Pakistan, mainly in the Indian region of Jammu, where it's written using the Devanagari script. In Pakistan, the language is known as Pahari and is written using the Arabic script instead. In 2003, it was recognized as the national language of India and the Indian constitution. It doesn't have the same status as Hindi or English nationwide, but it does have regional recognition. And in 2005, a collection of over 100 works published in Dogri over the last 50 years have been made accessible online by the Central Institute of Indian Languages. Now, a very interesting feature is that Dogri is a tonal language. We've also talked a bunch about tonal languages before, like the Bench and Bora languages of the B edition of the Honorable Mentions. Just go watch the video. Not only is it tonal, though, it's also Indo-European, which is highly unusual. Now, I have to note, some linguists might argue that other Indo-European languages also have tone, like Swedish and Norwegian, and some instances of tone might also be found in Baltic languages, like Latvian and Lithuanian, but big eh. While there is definitely evidence of the use of tones in these languages, I wouldn't say it's a defining characteristic of the language. I don't know about Swedish and Norwegian, but as a speaker of Latvian, it's referring to the garumzimus and the difference of intonation in words like ka and ka, but like eh. Anyway, in Dogri, tone actually counts. Take these phrases, for example. Koraha, it was a whip. Koraha, it was a horse. Koraha, it was bitter. I don't know how true this is, but some say it's the only in the European language to have this feature. But think about it for a second. This Indian Devanagarian Arabic written language is linguistically closely related to Slovakian, Icelandic, Welsh, Portuguese, Luxembourgish, Jamaican Creole than it is to other languages of India like Tamil or Malayalam, for example, or Arabic or Chinese that are also all in the immediate area of where it is. And that's linguistics for you. And last but definitely not least, the Daga language, also known as Dimuga or Naup. It's spoken mainly in the Milne Bay province of Papua New Guinea by about 9,000 people. It's part of the Dagan branch of the Trans New Guinea language family and is written using the Latin script. This language was a completely random find, but it just has so many random weird things just put together into one and it's so unknown, I just had to talk about it. Now, if you don't know anything about Papua New Guinea, know that it's the most linguistically diverse place on planet Earth, with a population of just over 8.5 million people and upwards of approximately 850 languages spoken in the country, this represents 12% of the whole world's total languages, and unfortunately the majority of them have fewer than a thousand speakers. Papua New Guinea is such a diverse place, but it's also very rural, infrastructurally underdeveloped, and a lot of these communities are extremely remote and very hard to reach, so many of these languages have barely any information on them at all. But back to Daga. Historically, many of the people of Milne Bay, also known as the Masim, participated in the Kula, a ceremonial gift-giving exchange. It spanned 18 island communities and thousands of people. Participants sometimes had to travel hundreds of kilometers to give these shell disc necklaces as signs of honor and respect, which is so nice. Another thing is that many of these peoples have a matrilineal hierarchy and descent system and trace their ancestry back in their mother's lineage. Now, the grammar of Daga is very complex, but the most interesting thing I read about them is their number system. Get this, they only have numbers for 1, 2, 3, 4, and 10 and use body parts to represent the rest. For example, Nani, hand, means 5, and Apen, man, means 20, counting all the fingers and toes. Which, I just can't help but wonder, like, if you're gonna do this, then why not just have names for the fingers or something instead of this whole mess, but that's none of my business, I guess. But yeah, once again, my European brain just can't comprehend how somebody can lead their daily life actually conversing like this. But that's it for the video. Today we travel to the sunny coast of the Adriatic Sea, the quiet northern part of Australia, the northern subtropics of India, and ending on the islands of Papua New Guinea. Hope you enjoyed the episode and learned something new. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel and maybe post a comment below telling me which one of these you found the most interesting and maybe some facts that I might have missed in the episode. Until next time, peace out.